What is up everybody, it's Megido, and before you comment, yes I upgraded my mic so there will be no breathing or anything like that in this video. Anyway, welcome to the second challenge run on this channel. The amount of support the SMT4 video got was overwhelmingly positive for a channel of this current size and I honestly cannot thank you guys enough for it. So, I did mention at the end of that video that I would redo my starting Magatama only run in Nocturne, which, by the way, that is still happening, so don't worry. But I am also going to put a twist on it. What is that twist? Well, you're just going to have to wait and see. In fact, the twist of that video will make the run astronomically harder than this run, which is why I'm doing this one first before that. So today, I am here to answer the question, can you beat Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne without buying Magatama and without fusing any demons? In Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne, Magatamas are your main source for getting new skills. Not only that, they also provide resistances to a certain element. For example, Magatamas that are ice type, or really ice focused, give you an immunity to ice. However, some Magatamas, if not most of them, do also give you a weakness. So, for example, the Ice-type Magatama Wadatsumi will give you complete immunity to ice attacks, but it does give you an electricity weakness. So, you might be asking, how are you going to get Magatamas and new skills for that matter without going to the shops? Well, if you've played Nocturne, you may have noticed that there are some Magatamas that are only obtainable through bosses or doing side content. The Magatamas that you get from bosses and side quests are going to be the only ones that I will have access to for the entire game. Now, the other part of this challenge is that I cannot fuse any demons. In every SMT game, excluding Digital Devil Saga, fusion is a fundamental part. It allows you to obtain new demons by fusing away two old ones, or three if you're doing sacrifice fusion, that you can't get any use out of anymore. Since I can't fuse demons, I'm going to have to get demons through negotiation, and if I can't get any more use out of a demon, I have to delete it. So the rules of the challenge are going to be going as followed. I cannot at any point in the game purchase any Magatama from the junk shops, and I cannot fuse demons away at any point in the game either. Demon Evolution and the Demonic Compendium are still going to be allowed. The fifth rule is, well, should be obvious, no cheating or hacking the game. However, because I'm playing on PCSX2, I am going to be allowing the use of save states outside of boss battles. The sixth and final rule is that I have to go for the true demon ending. Because I have to go for the true demon ending, that also means that I have to fight all the fiends and complete all the Kalpas in the Labyrinth of Amala. Without fusion and my limited arsenal of Magatamas, that is certainly going to be fun, especially with two certain bosses in the 4th and 5th Kalpa. Oh god, what did I get myself into? Before we do start, I'm going to make one thing clear. I'm not going to be playing the original western version of Nocturne that released back in 2004. The version of Nocturne that we got here in the west was the original Japanese Maniacs version that included Dante from the Devil May Cry series. But because we never got the first version that released back in 2003, it was just released as Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne. But there is also one no other version of Nocturne that we didn't get either. And that is the Maniacs Chronicle version, which just replaces Dante with Raido Kuzunoha the 14th. There is a reason as to why I'm playing the Maniacs Chronicles version over the Western version, but you'll find that out soon enough. And you might be wondering, well, if we didn't get Maniacs Chronicles version, how are you playing it? Well, because there is a fan translation that I will have linked in the description, and also the HD remaster uses the Maniacs Chronicles version as a base. At least the console versions do. Other than the few reasons as to why I'm playing this version, this version is basically the same, except Candelabrum has been corrected to Menorah, and some of the demons' names have also been corrected. With all the explanations and the rules out of the way, let's get started. Oh yeah, and also, because of how much I hate myself, I am going to be playing on hard mode. We begin having a dream about our MILF teacher, who tells us that the world is about to go to shit. She then asks our name, so like the basic bitch that I am, I just go with the protagonist's canon name, and because we also get to name the other major characters, I just stick with their canon names as well. We go to Yoyogi Park and meet a man named Hijiri, who gives us an occult magazine, and then we just head to Shinjuku Medical Center like nothing happened, and the medical center is, for some reason, empty. After searching for Mr. Cal, Isamu finds a keycard to the basement and gives it to us so we can search the basement, where we are then met face to face with Vegeta who tries to kill us with a Baphomet, but thankfully our mommy comes to save us before that can ever happen, where she then takes us to the roof and explains the end of the world. 
then the end of the world actually happens. Following that, the great disco ball in the sky tells us we have no hint of reason and to go find ourselves, but Lucifer comes along and gives us a demon bug to ensure that we can't develop a reason at all. Thankfully, weird demon bugs give us demonic power so we can kick some ass in post-apocalyptic Tokyo. We are then met by the game's tutorial and, oh boy is it an experience alright. You know how tutorials are supposed to be the easiest fights you'll ever have in a video game? Well, this is nothing like that. On normal mode, it's basically like that. On hard mode, you are most likely going to die if you get unlucky getting critted. And it's because of this that I'm allowing the use of save states in this run. After beating our first tutorial boss, we get our first level up. For this run, I'm going to be going for a magic build, which I know that's kind of shocking considering that people have been raving about a physical build in this game, but you'll see why later on. After beating the next three tutorial fights, we are now able to wander around Shinjuku Medical Center. While wandering, we go to the second floor and find the first demon of the run, that of which being a pixie, and it will always be a pixie no matter how many times you play this game. Now, even though this pixie is one of the weakest demons in the game, make sure you keep her up until the fifth Kalpa, because if you do, you get a huge reward. After beating some Preda ass and getting the Annex keycard, we recruit a Kodama and a Wapo, giving us a full team of four. So, now that we have a full team, it's time to take on the flying fish himself, Fornius. Now, Fornius may look threatening, but he really isn't. All he has is two ice attacks that Wapo is weak to, which I guess is kind of threatening and scary. But other than that though, he really has nothing. Keep electrocuting him with Pixie, and if you manage to shock him, get as many crits as you can, and soon, this flying fish will be squashed roadkill. Unlocking you the Ice-type Magatama Wadatsumi. Wadatsumi is going to be a big help, because not only does it give us our first multi-target magic attack, but it also gives us Fog Breath, which brings down an enemy's agility by two. After being medically discharged from the hospital and convincing Pixie to stay with us, we head to Shibuya, where we go to the club and see Chiaki who then stupidly decides to leave instead of staying with us. Displeased that our girlfriend just up and left us, I go to beat on this cat girl, who tells us about Organization 13. Before talking to Hijiri, I recruit a Shikigami, and that's basically it. Since I'm not allowed to buy any Magatamas from the shops, I just head into the Amala network, and let me just say, the Amala network. You can't leave Amala once you've entered, and just for this part alone, they crank the difficulty up to 11. If you are underleveled like I was, you are going to need extreme luck just to get by in basic battles, and don't even get me started on the encounter rates, the encounter rates are just as bad. Oh, and the boss in this area? Ugh, god, don't even get me started. The Spectre starts off as 6 separate entities, which means they get 6 press turns. But after three or four turns, they merge into one Mega Spectre with two press turns. And... Yeah, we get annihilated shortly after. After many failed attempts, I go out and grind. During the grinding session, my Pixie evolves into High Pixie and also learns Rakunda, which is going to be essential, and my Shikigami learns Tarunda and Sekunda, which is definitely going to make a huge difference. Now that I have a few more levels on me and every debuff skill, I go back and try again for the 10 million freaking time, and my demons get annihilated after the second phase kicks in. <sighs> Thankfully though, we get lucky with dodging and we win with just Demifiend alive, and now it is time to go to Ginza. Actually, that's a lie, because shortly after we walk into the light, we end up in the Labyrinth of Amala, which is the optional dungeon I need to complete to get the TDE. After Lucifer is done talking to us, we are now able to head to Ginza for real. Here we come across Rag's Jewelry, which is going to be an essential part of this because it allows us to get items that you can't purchase through the normal shops. However, you need special gems to get them, so we won't be here too often. I talk to Nyx at the bar, recruit an Opsars, and head to the Assembly of Nihilo's HQ, only to find out that we can't get in, so I go to this random warehouse and enter the Great Underpass of Ginza. While wandering around the sewers, we come across the mannequins who think we're a demon from a faction called the Mantra. They then see that we're not from the Mantra and just promptly fuck off. We talk to this mannequin who is collecting things that humans wants to use and says he'll let us through the EK Bukuro if we get him a 1000 yen bill, so we head back to Ginza, recruit Datsu Eba and Jack Frost, get the bill, beat this troll's ass, and now it's on to... 
Oh crap. Yep, it's time to take on the game's most infamous boss, Matador. So, as you all probably know already, Matador leads off with his signature skill, Red Capote, which maximizes his agility, making it damn near impossible to land any hits on him. Since I have the Kaja Stones, I'm at least able to negate it so I can get a few hits on him, but that doesn't stop him from casting it again. On top of that, his basic attack hits like a freight train. He has Mazan, which in itself isn't that bad. Provoke, which raises your attack by two levels, but decreases your defense by two levels. But those two combined aren't as egregious as his other skill, Andalusia. Andalusia is an AoE physical attack that can hit multiple times. This, combined with Provoke, is a guaranteed loss if you get unlucky. So, after a lot of failed attempts, it became clear to me that I would not be able to beat him with what I have set up right now, so... I go out to recruit Sudama, Isora, and Nozuchi, and then I attempt the fight again. Actually, before I do do that, I decide to do some grinding, and I eventually learn counter off of Margare. This is going to be a game changer, because we'll be able to tag on damage while it's on our turn, and counter has a 100% hit chance no matter if Matador has plus 4 to his agility or not. So finally, after god knows how many attempts, I beat Matador giving us his menorah and being able to go on to Ikebukuro. There's really nothing to do here other than just go to the Mantra HQ. I recruit a Momonofu before I do that so that I have a demon that has focus which doubles the damage of physical attacks for the next turn which is definitely gonna make things interesting. We head inside to see Isamu get absolutely slammed by Thor where we are then taken prisoner for trespassing with our only way out being a trial by combat. Orthrus and Yaxini are total pushovers. Orthos' weakness is ice, and Yaxini's weakness is electricity, so literally just exploit their weaknesses and take your win. Now it's on to Thor, and he is a little bit difficult, but not by a lot. He does have medium and heavy electric attacks, which can be scary if he does manage to get a lucky shock on you. And since the first electric in Mimagatama is locked behind this fight, make sure you bring in demons that block electricity, such as Shikigami, who repels it. Ice Breath is a godsend for this fight, because towards the end, I literally freeze him and punch him to death and take my win. Something I didn't even know was possible. Now that we've beat Thor, we get the Narukami Magatama and are immediately accosted by our next boss, who would be Dante, but in this version is Raido Kuzunoha, and oh boy is he a bitch. <laughs> and let me tell you why. He can start off with one of two skills, Boogie Woogie, which is a single target physical attack that can hit multiple times, or his most infamous skill, Yoshitsune, which is heavy damage to one target and has a very high crit chance. Now you might be asking yourself, why don't you just debuff him so that he doesn't do as much damage to you? Well that's the fun part, you see. He'll use Raptor Guardian to remove any debuffs you place on him. Theoretically, I could debuff him so that he wastes his first turn on removing them, but I'm also wasting a lot of MP by doing that, and MP is really scarce this early on in the game. After bringing him down to half health, he'll start using McCoy Boomerang, which is medium physical damage that is completely undodgeable and has a 30% panic chance. And also Provoke, which does exactly what it did in the Matador fight. After many failed attempts, I decided to put the fight off and complete the first Kalpa of the Labyrinth of Amala. So, for those of you who haven't played this game, the Kalpas are dungeons that are specifically designed to be as hard as possible, although their difficulty is entirely dependent on when you do them. So if you do them early as possible, like the moment they unlock, it's going to be a nightmare. If you put them off until later, like before you enter the Tower of Kagetsushi, they'll most likely be really easy. However, I decided to do the Kalpas really early on because not only is it challenging, but it also allows me to level up really fast. And during this time, my Nozuchi evolves into Guishian, which is going to be a big help. So I get to the end of the first Kalpa, I talk to Lucifer, and I head back to Ikebukuro to try to fight Raido again, now that I have a few more levels on me, and things go so much better. And by that, I mean I got lucky in the first phase, and then when the second phase kicked in, I threw up an attack mirror to guarantee a safety window, and after one brutal slash from Omonofu and one shock from Demifina later, Raido finally goes down after God knows how many attempts, allowing us to go into the Mantra HQ to see Mr. Ketchup Head himself, also known as Gozu Tenno. 
He gives us two new demon slots and we say thanks to him by telling him to piss off. We then head to the Assembly of Nihilo's HQ, which we can finally enter thanks to the mantra raiding it. In this dungeon, we have to find the four Kilo so that we can get to the Nightmare System, but Eligor really doesn't want us to have them, so much so that we have to fight him three fucking times. Now, the thing about these fights is that they're not hard, they're just really annoying. The first one has him summoning Diz, who tried to inflict stone on you, and if that happens to Demifiend, you might want to cure it before Eligor turns you into a pile of rocks. The second Eligor fight, he summons Yaka, who can heal him with the Arama, and that's really it. The Yaka that he summoned are really weak, so literally just don't change your strategy and just use electricity moves. The third and final Eligor fight has him summon the Incubus. They can be annoying with their evil gaze attack, reducing you to 1 HP. But thankfully, they are very weak, just like Yaka, so you can literally just kill them before they cast it, and yeah, just spam electricity moves and take down Eligor once and for all. After clapping Eligor, we have to fight Barith, who summons his host. The host will use Lullaby to put you to sleep, which unfortunately Momonofu is weak to, but other than that, this fight is literally just Eligor, but with an ice weakness. After taking down Barith, my Momonofu evolves into Arahabaki, which is going to be a game changer because this is my first demon that has an immunity to physical attacks. After gathering the four Kilas and opening the stairway to hell, I recruit an Eligor and come face to face with Vegeta once again, who throws Osijo at us. Cheetah Man thinks that just because he has focus along with Heat Wave, it means he's hot shit. If you don't have our Habaki, that's a maybe. With our Habaki, it's a definitive no, because he only uses physical attacks, and since Heat Wave is multi target, our Habaki will just block it, and Guishian and Demifiend having counter makes this fight an even bigger joke. He throws up a Tetracarn Shield to look threatening, but unfortunately for him, I've been investing in magic. So with literally no effort, OC Joe goes down and gives us the Anathema Magatama. We head back to Ikebukuro to see that the mantra have fallen and give next to no fucks about their situation. We start walking on the highway only to be confronted by Nicolas Cage and uh... Yeah, he flattens us so many times that we have no choice but to run like a little sissy bitch and finally get to Kabukicho Prison. Now, this dungeon is very annoying. It isn't hard, it's just tedious because of its gimmick. The gimmick is that you have to go into this thing called the Mirage, which basically puts you on the ceiling of the prison. I recruit a Naga and talk to this mannequin who's trying to escape by digging with a spoon. Unfortunately for him, he breaks it, and now we have to go get another one from the collector mannequin that we talked to in the sewers. So we get the spoon from him, take it to the other mannequin, and now we have to leave the Mirage, jump in the hole, and go back into the Mirage. Yeah, that isn't even half of why it's tedious, I just don't feel like explaining it because explaining it would take up precious runtime. So, after all the bullshit, we go to the fifth floor and now we have to fight Mizuchi, who is the head honcho of the prison. This boss is nothing special. It's just a more fancy version of a demon within the same dungeon. The only difference is that he has an attack called Mirage which can inflict panic on you. He did manage to inflict panic on everyone within his first turn, but thankfully it wore off rather quickly. Other than that, he has nothing. Light him ablaze with any fire attacks that you have available to you and take your win. We meet Fudomimi, Isama tells us to go fuck ourselves, and now we have to go through East DK Bukuro Station. While down here, I managed to recruit a Kelpie and a new way. Unfortunately, I'm now at the point where I have to start deleting demons, so I delete my Apsara so I can fit my new way into my party. So we get to the end of the station and finally arrive at Asakusa. We meet Sakahagi and go to play this piece of shit, sorry excuse of a minigame for a fucking hour just so I can get the gayest Magatama. Yes, a fucking hour. With a guide. Thank you, Buffmeister. Thankfully, this Magatama was actually worth the pain and suffering because it gives us the best healing magic in the game, except for Media Rahan. I head to Mifunashiro, talk to Fudo Mimi, and go back to Hijiri, who tells us to go to the Obelisk because that's where our teacher is being held for reasons we don't know yet. So we head there and are immediately accosted by the Moira bitches who just laugh at us and leave, and now we have to do what I think is one of the coolest puzzles in the game. Basically, you have to step on these tiles that'll change the moon phase, and the number of panels that are lit up are the number of times the moon phase will shift. After the first puzzle, I recruit a Kopa Tengu who necessarily isn't good, but the demons in his evolution line are going to be absolute units, especially his final evolution in the late game. After a bit of grinding, he learns Watchful, which allows him to gain EXP without being in the field, which will allow us to use demons that'll actually be helpful. 
finally, after God knows how many moon phase puzzles we went through, we're finally at the final one, where we have to fight the Moiray bitches one by one. Which you have to do in one moon cycle. The fights, albeit annoying, are easy, but don't grant you any EXP, which is really annoying, but... Eh, it's not that big of a deal. However, now we have to fight them at the same time. Since they are now working as a team, the fight is a bit more challenging. If you paid attention to their individual fights, you know that Clotho is the healer, Lachesis is the buff and debuffer, and Atropos is the attacker. Since Clotho is the healer, she is the first one you need to strike down first, that way she can heal Lachesis and Atropos. After you deal with Clotho, it doesn't really matter who you prioritize in taking down. Before you do enter this fight, I would highly recommend bringing in a demon that can block at least one of Atropos' attacks, that way the trio will lose turns so they can't heal or buff or debuff. So after what feels like an eternity, I finally bring down the Moiray bitches, giving us the Jed Magatama. This is going to be an essential in Magatama because it will give the Demi Fiend access to buffing skills, skills that will be absolutely taken to the endgame. We step into the light and save Mystic Owl, only for her to get possessed by this blue thing called Aradia. But she does give us two more demons to hold, so I guess we're cool. I talk to Hijiri, who tells us that Isamu is in the Amala network, but before we worry about him, I do decide to go back and fight Hellbiker. Since I have Kopa Tengu and Arhabaki, I am at least able to negate his Hell Spin and Hell Exhaust attacks. However, towards the end, he annihilates us thanks to his other skill, Hellburner, which, as the name suggests, is a fire attack that no one in my party blocks. So with that in mind, I go out and recruit an Iugami, and I also do some grinding, and during that time, my Kopa Tengu evolves into Karasu Tengu, and my Inuyami evolves into Mikami, giving us our first fire immune demon. So now that we have demons that can block one of his attacks in the party, I go to challenge Ghost Rider one more time. And this seems to be the run I had been looking for. Outside of his normal attack, he cannot do jack shit to our party since, again, one of my demons blocks at least one of his three hell attacks. So after many failed attempts, I finally bring down Nicolas Cage and can finally do the second Kalpa. Now wait, hold on. What about Daisojo? Yeah, so I lost the footage of my successful attempt, and this footage that you're seeing now is the only footage I have of ever fighting him, and that is like way earlier in the game, so yeah, it's unfortunate, but I can't really do much about it now. Anyway, so the second Kalpa can be described as jumping in holes and going through a maze. While down here, my Naga evolves into Raja Naga, and there's also this cursed hallway that if you make it through, you'll receive 250,000 Maka, which... Yeah, that ain't happening. There's also this shady broker that sells you a new way with the best healing moves for 50,000 Maka, which I don't have yet, but I'll be down here to get it later. After an hour of jumping in holes and going through a maze, the four horsemen of the apocalypse pull up on us and say they want to challenge us, specifically White Rider, who appears after you come out of any terminal, which is very fucking annoying. Not wanting to get our cheeks clapped by a skeleton, I decide to go into the Amalit network to look for Isamu. Before we can talk to him though, we have to fight the Spectre for a second time. Instead of unionizing it to one, the Spectres this time around are going to try to suck you dry of all your MP so that they can cast Megiddo. But there is this one simple trick of wasting your MP before you fight them, so this fight goes from challenging to a complete joke. We find Isamu, who gives us a speech about society and vanishes into thin air, then we exit the Amalit network and talk to Hijiri, who tells us that we might find something new. So with that in mind, I go down into the second Kalpa, buy the healing new way for 30,000 Maka, recruit Taraka and Oni, and proceed to fight Right Rider. And he is a complete joke, because his signature skill God's Bow is a light attack that is a 100% insta-kill on anyone who doesn't know it. Normally, this would be a problem, but I have this little friend called Tetraja that completely blocks it. We obtain his menorah, recruit Orthrus, tell Hikawa to shove his reason up his ass, and now it is time to go on to Yoyogi Park, where we have to obtain this thing called the Yahi Rona Himaroki for Mr. Cow. And. Oh god, let me just say. Fuck. This. Dungeon. I say this because of its gimmick. That gimmick being the Pixies giving you the runaround. If you go through the wrong corridor, the Pixies will just teleport you to the beginning of the section of the dungeon you're in. While here, I would highly recommend recruiting Oberon because of his Mediarama. Even though I already have the healing new way, I'm mostly just using him as my reviver since he does have Sonoric Harm. To make this dungeon a lesser pain in the ass, you can go atop these platforms to see which corridor a pixie is above. 
but you do have to make a mental note of it because you can't see them at ground level. Now we get to the next part of the dungeon that's an even bigger pain in the ass, and this is what I like to call the Cross and X Formation section. Basically, the pixies will alternate which corridors they're above in the shape of, you guessed it, an X or a cross. They will always start off in the X formation, and when you go under a corridor that none of them are above, they will change to the cross formation. Do be sure to make a mental note of what formation they're in, as guessing the wrong formation can really set you back. After wanting to bash my head through my desk, I finally get to the end of the dungeon where we meet Sakahagi, who summons the one-eyed elephant Girimakala. If you've played any SMT game before, you'll know that Gear McCall repels physical attacks, so this is one of the few fights in the game where investing in magic actually pays off. However, that doesn't make this fight any easier. He has Blight, which is a multi-target physical attack that has the chance to poison anyone it hits. Thankfully, Arahabaki blocks it, but he also has Panic Voice, Toxic Cloud, and Binding Cry, which Arahabaki is weak to, and I have no demons in my party that can block these ailments, so the only thing I can do is get lucky dodging. So, yeah, my first attempt goes horribly, and he kills me with a normal attack, which, by the way, hits like a freight train. So for my second attempt, I decide to have Demifiend be a support unit since he's the only one with Sukukaja, which is the only way to increase my odds of dodging Gary Mikala, because Gary Mikala, like most bosses in this game, has Dukunda. But thankfully, his only way to debuff us is with Rakunda, but my Guishian also has Rakukaja, so we can just reapply to the fence we lost. So, with some luck and a lot of buffing, Garamikawa is no more. Sakahagi, unpleased we murdered his pet elephant, tries to enact revenge on us, but he fails miserably. After the battle, my Karasu Tengu evolves into Kurama Tengu, who is going to be an absolute unit for the late game. So we get the Illuminati Triangle and give it to Mr. Cow, who turns back into a Radia. So we leave and talk to Hijuri, who tells us that Gozu Ketchup is alive. But before we worry about that, I head to the series to face Red Rider and he is a complete joke of a boss. I buy attack mirrors from Rag's Jewelry mainly to block his Terrorblade attack, but his powers keep on being dumb and keep using normal attacks on us, basically giving up any chance of being difficult. They can use Taro Kaja, but we can just easily cancel them out with Dekaja Rocks, so without even trying, we bring down Red Rider. We head back to the Mantra HQ, where we see Chiaki fusing with Gozu Tenno to where she now has Demigod status, and immediately after that, Isamu kidnaps Hijiri, so he must go into the Emolt Network one last time. We head in, and Isamu immediately tells us that he is about to perform a ritual to summon his Reason God at the Amala Temple and invites us to aid him. But before we can do that, we must take on the Spectre one last time. Thankfully, they aren't too hard, but they have Last Resort, which can really put you in a bad spot, and they are also immune to it because enemies don't have to abide by game rules. The best strategy for this fight is to keep using Focus Tempest with Rajanaga since you're almost guaranteed to land a critical hit on at least one of them, and also use Demifiend as a support unit. So in no time, we finally bring down the Spectre once and for all and can finally move on to the Amala Temple. On my way there, I managed to recruit a Virtue who has many Arama, so now I have more healing coverage. So we head inside the temple, where we have to take on three temples inside of it. Templeception. I recruit a Dominion and head to the Black Temple. The Black Temple can be described as breaking floors and jumping in holes, and yeah, you can figure the rest out. So we get to the end of the Black Temple where we have to fight Asiel, who takes the award of easiest boss in this dungeon, and that is mostly due to his exploitable attack pattern. That pattern being casting his signature skill, Soul... Uh, uh, you know what, I'm just gonna call it Black Sun because that's what it means in Latin. So anyways, this attack pattern being that he casts Black Sun, and then either casting Hades Blast or using a normal attack. Thankfully, Black Sun can only reduce you to 1 HP, so once you're at 1 HP, it can't do jack shit to you, and you can literally just cast Tetrakarn and he can't do anything to you. And th this is exactly how I beat him. Before moving on to the other temples, I decided to go back to Kabukicho Prison to murder Black Frost. Now, Black Frost can either be the easiest fight ever, or a big pain in the ass if you don't have the right setup. He has Mamudun, Mabufudine, and Berserk. For Mamudun, bring in Tetradra, whether it be the skill or the stones. For Mabufudine, bring in at least one demon that can block ice, in my case Arhabaki, who is also good for blocking Berserk, and he can also block Mamudun naturally, but that's kind of irrelevant because I have to use Tetradra anyway. I bring out Kurma Tengu for attacking since he has Tornado, which is a heavy wind attack, 
and I bring out Dominion because he has the Arahan. I would also recommend equipping the Watatsumi Magatama so that Demifiend doesn't take any damage from my Bufudine. So, after many tornadoes, we melt Black Frost away and obtain the Satan Magatama. We head to the White Temple, and it's a series of teleporting doors. In all seriousness, it isn't that bad. It's just like the one from the Hall of Eternal Light in SMT4. There's a guy that will tell you which door leads to which. We get to the end of the White Temple where we have to fight Albion. The thing about this fight is that he has four allies that represent one element. Their color should give you a big idea of what each element is, and their weaknesses are the opposite of what their element is. The kicker here is that you can't kill the head honcho first because his allies will just revive him, and you can't kill his allies because he'll revive them. What you have to do is kill three of his allies and leave one remaining. Then get both the remaining ally and the head honcho to their low health animations, and finally, you have to kill both of them at the same time. It's easier said than done because there's a chance that you can kill one of them on accident, but thankfully that doesn't happen, so we bring down Albion and his gang, and we can finally move on to the Red Temple, and... Let me just say... Holy shit, never has a dungeon maybe want to commit Persona 3. And if you're wondering why... Yep, the shadow hands that grab your ass cheeks turns the room red, which prevents you from progressing to the next floor, and you have to step into these lights to turn the room back to normal, and even then, you have to find your way around them, and if you fuck it up, guess what? You have to go back to the light and try to figure it out again. Honestly, just look up a guide for it because, in my opinion, it's not worth your time and patience to figure it out yourself. Thankfully though, the boss is really easy. Scotty is just as easy as Black Frost, with the only differences being that she has ailment skills, has a unique skill called Earthquake, which is severe physical damage to everyone. Thankfully though, it can't crate, and I can just bring out our Habaki to block it. She also drains physical attacks, making this yet another fight where going for a magic build pays off. So we bring down the third and final boss of the Amala Temple, causing the floating triangle that's in the center of the dungeon to come down. We go to see Samu drop Hijuri into a vat of Kool-Aid, which summons this killer whale-looking demon he names Noah. Before I leave, I go back into the Red Temple to recruit Dakini, and then I go to Shinjuku Medical Center to take on Black Rider. And, I've said this so many times, but I must say it again, he is a complete joke of a boss. His only signature skill is Soul Divide, which will cut your current amount of HP in half. He does have Megidola, Megidola, and Ikaja, but for whatever reason, he doesn't use the Kaja at all, basically letting at least one of us dodge his attacks since our agility is completely maxed out, and I beat him by dropping several wind cutters on him. Since I'm nearing the end game, I decided to go ahead and do some more side content. First up is the dick, not on a chariot, Mara. In terms of difficulty, I really don't know where to place him, but one thing you should know about him is that he is the only boss in the game that can use Diarahan whenever the fuck he feels like it. So, what I do is throw up Tetrakarn and pray to Kagetsuji that he uses Hades Blast so that I can get multiple hits on him. Then I just beat on him until he dies, which thankfully is exactly what happened. I obtain the Moosebell Magatama and go to finish off the last four horsemen of the apocalypse, Pale Rider. And he is somehow an even bigger joke than Black Rider. The way he's supposed to function is he and his Lois have ailment inflicting skills, and then Pale Rider will use Pestilence if you're poisoned from his Blight attack, or Eternal Rest if you're put to sleep. But the thing is, I can easily hear these ailments with my healing new way, who knows prayer, which is Medea Rahan, but it also cures ailments. However, in my first attempt, I don't do that simply because I didn't need it. And yes, I said first attempt, because towards the end of the fight, one of the Loas decides to cheap shot us and use Last Resort, which kills everyone on the field except for Kurumatangu. For my second attempt, they also use Last Resort again, but this time I have enough HP and defense buffs to stand my ground. And so, I am able to defeat Pale Rider, which means that we have finally defeated all four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and I could also go into the third Kalpa. The third Kalpa is really simple. Its gimmick is the stack-gated doors that can be opened once a certain stat is high enough in the red bar. So if you thought that the stat requirement accepted green bars, yeah, sorry, you're shit out of luck. Anyway, the only doors you have to worry about is the strength doors. However, there is one strength door that will let you through even if your stats are below the requirement, which really makes me question why it's there in the first place. So as I mentioned, the dungeon is really simple, and there is a reason for that. 
And that's because when we get to the end of the dungeon, we have to fight our good pal Raido Kuzunoha once again. Before we can fight him properly, he wants to play a little game with us. The first part of the game is simple, he's just chasing you as he shoots you. The second part has you flipping off two switches to open the door that leads to the third and final part, where you have to do the same thing but three times and go through little mini mazes. If this sounds easy, it's because it is. So we managed to win Raido's little game, and now we have to actually fight him. So on top of the moves he had in Ikebukuro, he now has new ones. Hidokoto, which is heavy wind damage that Kuruma Tengu drains, Nishiguji, which is heavy electric damage that Demi Fiend repels thanks to the Narukami Magatama, and finally, his last two skills, Jiraiya Dance and Tekisatsu. Both are all mighty attacks, with Tekisatsu having a chance to insta-kill. Thankfully, we managed to beat him before he even has a chance to use either of them. Yeah, remember what I said about the Kalpa's difficulties being dependent on when you do them? I wasn't kidding when I said that. I was able to take down Raido on my first attempt with magic attacks that were doing 500 plus damage. Raido, displeased that he lost to us a second time, tries to nuke us from orbit with a silent chant, but Goto tells him no and he gives us a Venora as an award for beating him. We talk to Lucifer for the third time and then head to Mifunoshiro where we see Chiaki just massacring the mannequins. Holy shit. <laughs> Now, for this part of the game, I could have fought Fudo Mimi, but I didn't because 1. I ain't no bitch, and 2. I wouldn't be able to anyway because I rejected Chiaki at the Mantra HQ, so by default, I have to fight the Archangels of literal fucking heaven. Now, the thing about these guys is that they aren't really hard per se, they can just be very annoying if you come into this fight unprepared. Raphael doesn't do anything except for casting Tetra Karn and or Makara Karn, and what's really annoying, that I don't think a lot of people who play this game know, is that Tetracard and Makarok are can stack on top of each other. But thankfully, activating one of the shields will activate both of them. Gabriel and Uriel are the attackers, but Gabriel likes to cast elemental skills, while Uriel likes to cast Almighty. I would highly recommend taking down Raphael first, that way you won't have to deal with Tetracard and Makarok. Then after that, it doesn't really matter who you prioritize. If this advice sounds familiar, that's because we have to do the same thing with the Moirai bitches. We bring down the Archangels and see Chiaki turn into a Reason God Ball Avatar. The next dungeon is the Dive Building, but I decide to go ahead and defeat the last two fiends, since literally they're on the way. Up first is Mother Harlot. This is yet another fight where going for a magic build pays off because she repels physical attacks. She has Maziodyne, which can be easily alleviated with the Narukami Magatama, but it doesn't damage her since she also has electricity immunity. Her signature skill is Beast Roar, which is an almighty attack that hits everyone and heals her for 500, but in the 4 minutes of fighting her, she doesn't cast it at all. And yes, I really said that. It only took me 4 minutes, and that's thanks to Kurma Tengu's Wind Cutter. Yeah, in case I haven't said it already, Kurma Tengu is an absolute unit. Now, we are on to the last fiend of the game, Trumpeter. And holy fucking shit is he miserable. He has every multi-target heavy magic attack, and also has Mega Dolan, which is a Mega Almighty damage. But the two skills that make this fight so infamous are Holy Melody and Evil Melody. Holy Melody is always casted at the beginning of the fight, and it fully heals whoever has the lowest health percentage. Yeah, it's not by actual numbers. But here's the kicker. It can also heal him, and if that happens when you're near the end of the fight, you may as well just reset. The bullshit doesn't end there, oh no! Remember the other skill I mentioned? Evil Melody? Well that skill straight up kills whoever has the lowest HP percentage. If I had Endure, I'd be able to survive at least one of them. Actually no, only one of them. But unfortunately, it's tied to the Vimana Magatama, which you have to get through one of the shops. Yeah, this is the only fight in the game where healing can actually be detrimental. The best thing you can do is use single target healing on Demi Fiend, that way he won't be targeted by Evil Melody, but you should also bring a demon you don't care about onto the field when he's getting ready to use it, that way a demon you actually need will be safe. For Holy Melody, well you have to take more risks by getting one of your demon's HP percentage below his. There are two flaws with this, one, you have a high risk of him killing that demon before he casts it, and two, there's no way to know what his HP percentage is unless you add up all the damage you've dealt, which I didn't do. So all I could do was pray to Kagetsuchi that at least one of my party members had a lower HP percentage than he did. Unfortunately, in my first attempt, my prayers go unanswered and he fully heals himself, prompting me to reset. My fourth attempt? Yes, my fourth attempt, 
is when I start taking risks with not just demons that aren't useful, I also start taking risks with demons that I actually need, because I didn't care anymore. And I actually start getting the luck that I needed. When he casts the first evil melody, he takes out Oberon, so I bring out Dominion in his place. Later on, I decide to take a risk and leave Demifiend unhealed, and Trumpeter casts Holy Melody and fully heals Demifiend. That decision right there was probably the most riskiest decision I've ever made, but it paid off. Towards the end of the fight, he goes for Evil Melody again, which kills Rajanaga. I was contemplating on bringing out another demon, but I saw that he was in his well health animation, so I said screw it and decided to finish the fight with just three demons. After many wind cutters, glacial blasts, and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, we finally bring down Trumpeter, defeating all of the fiends and completing our menorah collection. Now that we have all the menorahs, I decide to go and do the fourth Kalpa. The fourth Kalpa can be very annoying if you don't know what you're doing, because immediately when you walk in, you're greeted to a cursed hallway like the one we've seen in the second Kalpa. It isn't that bad, just make sure you watch the encounter meter at the bottom right corner of the screen and heal up when it's in the red. After you slowly but surely get out of the cursed hallway, you'll be greeted by this wormhole looking thing. This thing is what can make this Kalpa very annoying. Where you'll end up is entirely dependent on what mood phase you're on when you go through it. If you want to make progress, go through it when the moon phase is on new. When you do, you'll be greeted by another cursed hallway. To get through here, go straight, then take a right, then an immediate left, then go straight again, where you'll be greeted by a door with an ominous looking name. We go through it, and now we have to take on the boss of the fourth Kalpa, Beelzebub. And Beelzebub is a bastard. He resists everything in the game except for Almighty and Fire, and his normal attack hits like a freight train. The first part of the fight is manageable, but when he's taken around 5,000 damage is when he starts trying. He will always consistently cast Focus and then Dakunda. I would highly recommend that you don't cast Tetra Card or use an Attack Mirror, because if you do, instead of using his normal attack, he'll use his most infamous skill, Death Flies, which is Mega Almighty damage with a chance to insta-kill you. To alleviate the insta-kill, throw Tetraja up at the beginning of the fight. Not that it makes much of a difference, because it's still a shit ton of damage, and when he first casts it, he kills everyone in my party except for Demi Fiend. After my first four attempts, I decided to put the fly on hold and go through Yurikicho Tunnel. On our way there, I recruit a power, and while in there, I also recruit a Cerberus. Cerberus is going to be especially useful because on top of having Iron Claw and Fog Breath, he also learns Prominence, which is the second strongest fire attack in the game, with Magma Axis being the strongest. A skill that Demifin can learn, but from the Gehenna Magatama, which is only obtainable through the shops. Yeah, hi, so you're seeing this black screen right now because I realized that I was wrong about Cerberus learning prominence. He doesn't learn prominence, he learns Hellfire, which is significantly weaker than prominence, so... Yeah, and I'm way too far into the editing process to change it properly, so... Yeah, this will have to make do. We get through Yurikucho Tunnel and finally arrive at the Diet Building. But before going further into the Diet Building, I decide to make a pit stop at the third Kalpa. Why, you may ask? Well, so that Black Frost can join us without our consent, of course. Now, even though his skill set is mediocre at best, Black Frost is still a good demon to have around because of his resistances alone. Having a demon that blocks or resists damn near fucking everything in the game is invaluable. I also go down to the 4th Kalpa and go to the Shady Broker who sells me a demon for 50,000 Maka. And that demon is none other than Mothman, who has every multi-target heavy magic skill. I go back to the wormhole in order to gain the Hell's Vault which you can enter if you enter it during a full moon. There's not a lot in here, but there's this old fuck who won't let us through unless we sit at his dialogue for 3 fucking minutes. The wait is actually worth it because in one of the cash cubes, you get 100,000 and 1 Maka, and there's also another one that has a Death Stone. If you don't know what that does, it allows you to feud the fiend race of demons at the Cathedral of Shadows, but unfortunately for this run, it is all but useless because I can't fuse demons. We head back to the Dive building where we have to fight three bosses. Up first is Surt. He specializes in both physical and fire attacks, and what's really interesting is that his normal attack is actually part fire, so it can only be blocked by fire resistance. But because it's also a physical attack, it can be boosted by focus and can also crit. For this fight, bring out demons that have an immunity or resistance to fire. You can bring out Fizz Resist if you'd like, but he rarely goes for his physical attacks. Up next is Mata, who drains physical attacks, making this yet another fight where a magic build pays off. 
But who boy is he a bitch. And that's thanks to him nuking us with Hades Blast. Three times in a row. In my successful attempt, I get pretty lucky dodging Hades Blast. He summons Pazuzu onto the field, but that's pretty detrimental to him because Pazuzu is weak to ice. So I can just spam Mabufudine and Glacial Blast on his ass while getting extra turns. So without issue, Mata goes down. Now we are on to the last mini boss, and you guessed it, it's the Beast Eye Spammer himself, Mott. And he is a complete joke because I was able to obtain Bolt Storm from the Adama Magatama that I got from Albion. And he doesn't even spam Beast Eye, not even once. Oh, this guy also exists? Yeah, he's an even bigger joke. We walk into this acid trip of a room where we see Hikawa and Mr. Takao having a back and forth. He notices us and tells us to leave, which I gladly do. Yeah, you are totally allowed to skip the main boss of the dungeon, the main boss being Slifer the Executive Producer. Hikawa goes full Super Saiyan and becomes his Raisin God, Ariman. Miss Takao gives us the Illuminati Triangle and tells us to shape the world as we please. Now we have unlocked the final dungeon of the game, the Tower of Kagetsuchi. However, we cannot go in just yet, because on top of being the final dungeon, it's also where the alignment lock happens. So if I go in before I complete the Labyrinth of Amala, I'll be locked into one of the normal endings. So I unfortunately have to go rematch Beelzebub. I go back to the fourth Kalpa and begin grinding. During that time, my Satanta evolves into Cuckoo Lane, and that's really it. After grinding for some time, I go back to challenge Beelzebub once again. And he uses Double Death Flies, something that has a low likelihood of happening. Then he uses Megi Dolan, then a normal attack and kills me. After trying and resetting god knows how many times, I finally got my successful attempt. This attempt was 50-50 on luck and actual strategy. For strategy, I relied on four demons, Kurma Tengu, Cerberus, Kukulain, and Arhabaki. Kukulain is my main support unit since he has Sukukaja in healing. Cerberus is my main attacker because he has fire attacks. Arhabaki is a demon shield for normal attacks if I'm lucky, and Kurma Tengu will act mainly as an attacker, but a support unit if need be. For the luck side of things, I have to pray that he keeps using Mazandine and Mazionga. Kurma Tengu drains Mazandine and Cuckoo Lane repels it, tagging on more damage. For Mazionga, I equip the Narukami Magatama, and as for his normal attack, well, I just have to pray that he doesn't use it too often. Unfortunately, he kills Kukulain with a focused normal attack, so I bring out Arhabaki in his place, who, on top of being my normal attack shield, has Tetraja, that I got from a lucky skill mutation. When he goes for his first death flies, not only do we avoid death, but it doesn't do jack shit to us, mostly due to all the defense buffs we have. He then casts it again, and, just like the first time, we avoid the insta-kill and it doesn't hurt us that much. After that, he just kept on spamming Mazandine and Mazionga, and I was finally able to take down the Lord of the Flies after god knows how many attempts and resets. Man, I really feel like I just got a huge weight off my shoulders. We go into the room he was blocking and collect our rewards. Most notably the reward of the cash cube, which gives us 66,666 maka. Heh, <laughs> nice. So, what do we do from here? Well, you have to talk to this Mothman who tells you about a star key that someone in the second Kalpa knows more about than he does. So we go to the second Kalpa and go through the cursed hallway that's no longer cursed and talk to Ifrit, who tells us to go and get the key from Loki and Ginza. So we go to Ginza, only to find out that Loki gave the key to the Collector Mannequin, so we have to get it from him. Actually, not really, because there's a glitch in the game that allows you to get the key from any shop, but you will get called a dummy if you do it. We obtain the key, then we have to go into the third Kalpa, where we unlock the star door, jump into a hole that leads to the fourth Kalpa, Hit the switch, go back into the third Kalpa, go back into the fourth Kalpa, jump into the hole where we now arrive at the fifth Kalpa. Yes, this process is as tedious as it sounds. Upon entering, we are accosted by our old pal Raido Kuzanoha. Instead of wanting to fight us, he offers to join our party, which we gladly accept. Before he does join, we throw up Mahjong tiles, 
If we guess right, which we do, we get 100,000 Maka. But if we guess wrong, we would only get one. After that, he joins us, and man is he a beast. Yoshitsune is the crit machine it always was in his fights, but that's not the reason why. The skill he learns later on, the Aeon, makes Yoshitsune go from great to a fucking killing machine. It boosts all of Ryo's physical attacks by 50%, but that's not all it has to offer. Remember in the Maniacs version that Dante's booster skill, Sun's Oath, only provided a 50% physical boost? Well, in the Chronicles version, the Aeon does just that, but it also provides Pierce, which will go through any resistance except Repel. This is the big reason why I chose to play this version, not only that, but the translator of the Chronicles version made it so that Pierce affected both physical and magic, because in the Maniacs and HD versions, Pierce only affects physical attacks, and this is actually why I went with a magic build. Anyway, back to the Kalpa. The 5th Kalpa's main gimmick is similar to the 3rd Kalpa with all the stagnated doors, but cranked up to 11. There is a door that requires you to present the demon that has been with you the longest. This is where your pixie comes in. Once you present her, you will get a super pixie. Level 80, with 30 in every stat, with Megidolon, Maziodine, Medirahan, Endure, and Samurai Karm. After that, you can just use her to unlock every stat-gated door, except for the two that require Beelzebub and Metatron. Speaking of whom... Yep, it is now time to take on the boss of the 5th Kalpa. The only way I can describe him is Beelzebub on cocaine. He has Mahama on, Holy Wrath, which cuts your current HP in half, Tarukaja, Makakaja, Dekaja, Dekunda, Megidolon, and worst of all, Debility, which drops all your stats by one. All of those combined, however, are not as egregious as his most threatening skill, Fire of Sinai, which is mega almighty damage to everyone and it can hit multiple times, meaning your death if you're unlucky. I'm gonna highly recommend you bring in Ice Attacks, preferably Glacial Blast since it's heavy ice damage that can hit one to two times. But yeah, our first attempt doesn't go well at all because he just obliterates us with Fire of Sinai. Three times in a row! You're probably expecting me to now explain what strategy I used to defeat him, but th there is no strategy that I can describe when one of his most powerful moves decides whether you survive or not. So yeah, this fight was just 80% luck and 20% actual strategy, and uh, I, I get lucky enough to beat him. After beating Metatron, we ride the elevator down to Lucifer, where he unlocks a hidden power within the Marugari Magatama. We sink it to the Vata Kool-Aid, and we awaken in the hospital, meaning we are locked into the true demon ending. Now we can enter the Tower of Kagetsuchi. But before we do that, and I really hope you've gotten used to me saying that by now, I decide to go and defeat the last remaining side bosses. Up first is the four Onis. Oh yeah, and before I forget, I grinded in the fifth Kalpa, and my Persky evolved into Ganesha, yeah, okay, anyway, back to the four Onis. They are complete and utter jokes, so here's just four compiled clips of me beating each of them. Beating all four of them gives you the Murukumo Magatama. We come to this cave that we had one of our demons mine for seven moon cycles and pick up the Kimon Stone. And what it lets you do is go to this temple to fight Bishamantan. Bishamantan can be described as a big joke. Uh, oh, uh, uh, never mind. Yeah, the best thing you can do for this fight is bring in any form of fizz and fire resistance, debuff his accuracy, and pray that Hasuhapa misses. He does have an ice weakness, so just spam that into him until you beat him. Beating him gives us the best Magatama of the run, Gundari, which will provide Wind Cutter. Yes, the Wind Cutter that Kurumatengu has. With our magic build, it'll be a force to be reckoned with. Now that I did all the side content that's available in this run, I head back to the Amala Temple so that I can bring down the Tower of Kagetsuchi for the endgame. I immediately recruit a throne who, in his base form, is really good, because he has prominence and later on learns Media Rahan and Debilitate. So anyway, like all final dungeons in every SMT game you play, the Tower of Kagetsuchi is long as hell and is divided into three sections. When you get to the end of the first one, you have to fight Hikawa's reason boss, Arimon. 
before I talk about the fight itself, I should mention that every reason boss has a gimmick in its first phase. For Arimon, he will ban you from using certain skill types like physical and healing. If you break these rules, he'll kill the offending party member with Hell's Call. This gimmick is obviously just don't be stupid and do literally anything but what is banned. After some time, we get to the actual fight, and he obliterates us with Apocalypse, which is mega almighty damage, because of course it is. My second attempt doesn't go any better. I survive his Apocalypse attack, so I guess that's good, but he kills Ganesha with a normal attack and then later kills us with Tentacle, which is mega physical damage. For my third attempt, I decide that buffing while not progressing the first phase is better than buffing while progressing it. Arimon doesn't gain access to Dekaja or Dekunda until his second phase kicks in. Assuming you did what I just did, you should get to the second phase in just two turns after fully buffing yourself and debuffing him. After it kicks in, go all in with your best attacks, and soon he'll be in his low health animation. And what's really funny is that he doesn't even use Dekaja or Dekunda a single time. So in about 7 minutes, I'm able to take down the first reason boss. Hikawa gives us the Earth Stone, and now it is time to move on to the second part of the tower. While here, I recruit your Lunger, Floros, and Nyx. All three of them, while they won't be as effective in the final fights, they're still worth leveling up in case you do absolutely need them. The second part of the tower is really annoying, because you have to deal with one-way invisible paths and falling in holes. And yeah, that's really it. After getting through it, we now have to fight Isamu's reason boss, Noah. Noah's gimmick doesn't kick in until after a few turns, to which he casts Aurora, which changes his affinities. Before casting it, he takes neutral damage to everything, but once he does, he repels physical attacks, has a resistance to almighty attacks, and repels every skill type except for one. To figure out what he doesn't repel, you have to see what skill he casts. For example, if he casts Agidine, he takes damage from Ice and vice versa, and the same is true for Wind Electricity. Later in the fight, he'll eventually stop casting these attacks, but the order will remain the same. The order in terms of what you can hit him with are Ice, Fire, Force, and Electricity. However, it is completely possible to lose track of what you can hit him with. To partially alleviate that problem, I decide to keep stabbing him with Raido's Tenkitsatsu since it's an almighty physical attack, and because it's an almighty attack, he can't do anything to stop it. Now wait, didn't I just say he has a resistance to almighty? Well, yes I did. But before I fought Noah, Raido learned the Aeon, so now I have Piers. This doesn't make the fight easier though, because it's also around this time of the fight where he begins casting Domination, which drains your HP and MP and gives it to him. Now, normally this would be a problem, but he only casts it once the entire fight and just spammed us with elemental moves. So, I just kept stabbing him with Tekitsatsu and took my win. We received the Netherstone, and now we can finally move on to the final section of the dungeon. I recruit Ranga and bump into Thor, who wants to have a rematch with us. Unfortunately for him, we block everything in his moveset, so... Yeah, I, I really don't need to go over him that much. Back to the actual dungeon, this part of the tower is very annoying because it's a series of teleporting platforms, and it can be very frustrating if you don't know what leads to where. Here's a guide I found on Neoseeker for a rough idea of what you need to do. I recruit Lilith and finally make it out of the teleporting maze. Yeah, this is one of the few puzzles I don't want to repeat ever again. My throne evolves into Uriel, and now we can take on the final reason boss. Chiaki's reason boss, Ball Avatar. Ball Avatar has two gimmicks. One is where she casts her unique skill, Bale's Bane, which will turn anyone who doesn't block it into a fly. And the second one is summoning the McFlurry Bros after a certain damage threshold. Osei Halel is scripted to immediately heal her with Diarahan when he's first brought in, and whenever she takes damage after that. I'm gonna highly recommend you take down Osei first since he's the healer and the attacker, then take down Floro since all he could do is buff and debuff. My first attempt, however, ends with Floro's killing Ragna and Uriel with Haso Hapa, a move I didn't even know he had, and then he kills Demi V with Miragi Dai. For my second attempt, I decide to do what I did with Arimon and maximize our buffs and debuffs before she summons in Osei and Floros. After she summons them, go in, and in no time, Osei McFlurry goes down, leaving just Floros McFlurry and Ball Avatar. Floros unfortunately removes our buffs, but it doesn't matter since he goes down in a few turns, only leaving Ball Avatar. And she cannot do anything to us outside of Megidola because we block Bale's Bane and Holy Wrath, so in just a few more turns, while Avatar falls, eliminating all of the reason bosses.
We get the Heaven Stone and can finally get to the final boss of the Tower of Kagetsuchi. And that boss is... Kagetsuchi himself. Kagetsuchi is a really unique fight because it's the only fight in the game where the moon phase actually matters because it determines how much damage he takes independent of buffs and debuffs. At full, he'll take 50% of what you'd normally deal, at half you'll deal the normal amount you would, and at new you'll deal 200% more damage. When he's at full, however, he'll always cast Fast Light, which is undodgeable Mega Almighty damage. Despite it being Mega Almighty damage, it actually isn't a big threat as long as your defense is max and his attack is at its minimum, which should always be the case even though he does have Dekaja and Dekuna, but he doesn't even use them at all. This is only for the first phase of the fight. The second phase is where you have to be a little bit more mindful of what you're doing. In this phase, the moon will remain at full, but his defense is neutral so you'll be dealing damage you normally would. What you have to look out for is when he says a dialogue. When he does this, it means he's going to use his other unique skill, Infinite Light, which is severe almighty damage. But as long as your defense is at its max and his attack is at its minimum, like with Vast Light, you should be able to survive it. That's literally the entirety of the second phase of the fight. Keep yourself buffed, heal when you need to, and finally you can say that you beat Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne without fusion and without buying any Magatamas. Oh, fuck. Yeah, this is hell. Allow me to tell you why. Lucifer has the maximum amount of HP an enemy could possibly have in the game, which is 65,535. The first part of the fight isn't so bad, but can be frustrating if you get off to a bad start. The skills he has access to at the start are Babufu Dying and Evil Gleam. Evil Gleam has a 60% chance to charm, which is horrible, especially if you get unlucky and one of your party members heals him. I should also mention that his normal attack is part almighty and has a very high crit chance, which means that he can kill a party member at the start of the fight. When he's taken around 10,000 damage, he busts out Megidola, which isn't too problematic. But when he's taken around 15,000 to 20,000 damage is when he decides that it's time to start trying, and will bring out the big guns such as Prominence, Glacial Blast, Megidola, and his two most infamous skills, High King and Root of Evil. High King is heavy almighty damage that is completely undodgeable and has a 50% bind chance. I know that the wiki says it has a 100% chance to bind, but if that was the case, everyone who doesn't outright know it or resist it would be getting binded every time he casted it. Then there's Root of Evil, which is just like Kenji's Ancient Curse attack from SMT4, but completely up to luck on what happens to you. You have a 40% chance to lose half of your HP, a 20% chance to lose 3 quarters of your HP, and a 10% to lose 90% of your HP. Oh, and to make your day even worse, there is also a 10% chance that he can either inflict Mute, Poison, or Stun. Now, you might be saying, oh, well, at least the odds of being affected aren't 50% or above. Well, firstly, you have to remember that it targets everyone, so the chances are high. And secondly, you might want to remember what game we're playing here. I tried, and tried, and tried, and tried, and tried, and still no success. I almost forgot to mention that after he's taken 40,000 damage, he'll immediately or later cast Diarahan, which effectively resets the fight. That can either be a good thing or a bad thing, depending on whether or not you're close to death. After many, many failed attempts, I decide to grind, specifically incenses from the shops. Throughout the game, you may have noticed that you get these lucky tickets from the shops. You get these every time you spend a thousand or more maka. When you rack up ten of them, you'll get the option to open three mystical chests. The one you want to open is the white box, which will either give you a Balm Arising or one of the five incenses for one of your stats. If you've racked up a shit ton of Balms Arising like I did, you can just reload your save, if you get another one. Here is what I mean by that. When you load a save file, what you get in one of the three chests is predetermined, meaning that even if you try to change what you get with save states, you'll get the same thing every time until you either just accept what you get and try again with 10 more lucky tickets, or reload your actual save file. I didn't do this my first go around simply because I didn't know about it until a couple of months after, and I said something. Something that's against the rules, simply because I got impatient. That's right, we're gonna cheat. Now, I know what you're probably thinking, but hear me out. What I'm not doing is I'm not hacking skills onto me that are impossible for me to get in this particular run, or skills that are impossible to get in any normal playthrough. 
I'm talking about giving myself an EXP multiplier. This is the list of codes in case you're wondering. The EXP cheat that I'm using will multiply my EXP gain by 2, which isn't a huge boost, but makes grinding faster and less painful. And if you think it makes fighting Lucifer less painful... Yeah, god no, it's just as painful. Unfortunately, these cheats do not work with the Maniacs Chronicles version, so I have to go back to the US version that has Dante. During the session, I recruit Queen Mob, and my Uriel mutates his Megidola into prayer. That is probably the best luck I've ever had in this game, since the only demon I have that has prayer is Nue, who is very low level. After some leveling, I go back to the Chronicles version and continue incense grinding. I get a strength incense that brings my strength stat up to 24, so with that, I go back to the Mantra HQ to go get the Gaia Magatama, which gives a significant strength boost. Even though I said I was going for a magic build, my recent failures with Lucifer have made it clear that magic is not going to cut it and I have to start using strength, so... Yeah, I just decided to level up strength, and since I got Spiral Viper from Gundari, it's going to be a big help since it's mega physical damage and has a medium crit chance. So with all of that, I go to challenge Lucifer one final time. The party members I bring out for this fight are Raido, Uriel, and Queen Mob. Raido because of Yoshitsune, Uriel because he has Debilitate and Prayer, and Queen Mob because she's the only demon with Tarokaja and can also heal. For the first part of the fight, fully buff your attack and defense, and fully debuff all of Lucifer's stats. I would highly recommend doing some damage to him, but don't push him below 10k. To stop you from doing that on accident, use a calculator to keep track of how much damage you've dealt. Once you've pushed him past 10,000 and 15,000, the only advice I can give you is buff up with Rakakaja with Demi Fiend if you have it, or attack with him, attack with Raido, use Debilitate or Healing with Uriel, and use Tarokaja with Queen Mob. Other than that, all you can really do is pray to Kagetsuchi that you get lucky that he either gets stupid, doesn't bind with High King, or use Root of Evil with his only available press turn. Towards the end, he kills Queen Mob with a normal attack, which really makes me shit my pants. I contemplate on whether I should bring out another demon or just power through with just three party members. I decided to just stick with three party members since I was now in the damage threshold where he'll cast the Arahan. But I also saw that he was close to death. He stuns Demi Fiend with Root of Evil, and I give Uriel a Soma Droplet, and in some stroke of luck, Raido crits with Yoshitsune, so I cast Prayer and fire off one final Spiral Viper, and finally take down Lucifer. Yes! Oh my god! Oh my god! Holy... Holy shit! Holy fucking shit! Oh my god, finally! Oh! Holy shit! It's over! It's over! Holy crap! Holy crap! Oh my god, that just fucking happened! Lucifer congratulates us. Our eyes turn red, we walk towards the screen, and then the credits roll. Well, there you have it everybody! It is possible to beat Shin Megami Tensei Nocturne without buying Magatamas and without fusing any demons. Yeah, this is definitely a run I'm glad is over and that's thanks to Lucifer being a bitch in this game. Unlike his SMT4 counterpart, he will make sure you suffer a lot. As for what's happening next, well, I've gotten a lot of requests to do SMT4 Apocalypse to follow up SMT4, so as you guys have requested, that will be the next run. Instead of doing it Whisperless and Default Armor only, I decided to replace the Default Armor part with something that is way worse. Like, 10 times worse. What that is? Well, you'll just have to wait and see. Well, that's all I have to say. Thanks for watching, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. I'll leave a link in the description to the Maniacs Chronicles English patch, as well as links to my newly started Ko-Fi and Patreon. Alrighty, I'll see you all in the next one.